So, studying sacred scripture with Thomas Aquinas. Everyone knows that St. Thomas wrote the Summa Theologiae, a kind of major textbook of theology, though I prefer to see it as the first degree course in theology for those who've done philosophy already. It's often seen, or has been seen, as a grand edifice like a medieval cathedral, especially Salisbury, which is built in one go and coherent, seen as an exercise in systematic theology, and even an attempt to combine Aristotelian philosophy with inherited dogma, perhaps to the detriment of any biblical perspective. Those who know more about St Thomas have recognised his use of St. Augustine and perhaps of the shadowy figure Pseudo-Dionysius and even other fathers of the church, Eastern and Western, which gave a Neoplatonic strand to St. Thomas's thought. What he actually says at the beginning of the summer is that Sacra Doctrina the whole business of exploring and handing on the Christian faith draws primarily on sacred scripture. And that has been something difficult for people to acknowledge. So I think we need to re-envisage the medieval method of theological formation. On some days there was a disputation on some topic, but most days in the School of Theology there were hours of lectura on sacred scripture. The master would read the sacred text and comment on it. So here is Hugh of St. Victor lecturing on sacred scripture. Given that the master lectured from six to eight in the morning when people were fresh (laughs) and the bachelor for the next two hours, um, that may be a more accurate picture of what it really looked like. (laughs) But they tried to get into the sacred text and its rich meaning. And I guess the Summa Theologiae was intended to give an overview of the field so as to contextualise what would be studied before students were thrown into the deep end of wrestling with the complex text of sacred scripture. But as Mark Jordan has pointed out in his recent book Teaching Bodies, The summer presupposes a good knowledge of scripture already. The people studying would have been used to the divine office and the mass, with that kaleidoscope of short and long scriptural texts and the singing of the psalms, some every day and the rest every week. The art and architecture of the period would be redolent with scripture. The Bible Moralise was produced in the 13th century, page after page, with above the Old Testament text and below some kind of commentary and application either allegory, um, typology, or a moral application. Here we have God the Creator forming Eve from Adam's side as he sleeps in the garden. And here we have Christ sleeping in death on the cross as the new Adam. (coughs) And Christ again, as the midwife, is drawing the church out from his side. The new Adam gives birth to the new Eve, his bride, the church, as he sleeps in death 
in the garden where he was crucified. That kind of picture would be common knowledge to everyone. And going beyond our period, um, once printing was available in Europe, we flooded the Bible, the market with Bibles for the poor. Picture Bibles with a lot more on the page than this, texts and commentaries and cross-references. Um, and in the centre, a New Testament scene like Pentecost with two or four Old Testament scenes. On the left, you have Moses receiving the law from Sinai, which was what the Feast of Pentecost celebrated for the Jews. <laughs> Christ, the new Moses, has gone up to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, who is the new law. And here on the right, you have the prophet Elijah, dressed like a Dominican, calling down fire on the sacrifice. <coughs> so everyone would already have a basic knowledge of scripture that Thomas can presuppose. In the summer itself, as far as I can see, Thomas breaks new ground in using scripture, in uniting scripture and doctrinal, moral, spiritual theology. He includes a very detailed commentary on the various precepts in the Torah, showing their continuing relevance to life, to politics and to faith. In the Tertia Pars, he covers not just the incarnation and its metaphysics and the passion, but the whole of Christ's ministry and saving work. His discussion of the names of God, the nouns and adjectives about God, is an analysis of biblical language, together with his discussion of metaphor, the name revealed to Moses, and the senses of scripture. So it shouldn't be any surprise that Thomas wrote commentaries on the Old Testament and the New, which helped him develop his own theological ideas. The commentary on Job feeds into his understanding of divine providence. His mature account of how Christ saves us seems to me <coughs> to include a new train of thought sparked off by what's in Romans. Christ was put to death for our sins and raised to justify us. So we have scriptural commentaries of St Thomas, either things he more or less wrote, or lectures that he dictated and other people have reported for us. So the first three papers of today will look at aspects of three of St Thomas's commentaries, and the fourth paper will expound a valuable tool for studying Aquinas' works, not just his scriptural commentaries. And then, to bring it all together, Father Bruno will speak about our need to do what St Thomas did and bring together scripture and dogmatic theology. But, of course, we have to do so in a way that takes account of modern biblical scholarship. So, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker. Father Piotr Roshak is the Professor of Fundamental Theology at the <coughs> Universitet Mikolaia Kapernika of Torunyu, which I'm, I'm sure you understand, and if you don't, you should. He was founder of the Centre of Biblical Thomism there, and he's an Associated Professor of Systematic Theology at the University of Navarra in Pamplona, where he did his doctorate on mystery in the theology of St. Thomas Aquinas. He's a member of the Pontifical Academy of St. Thomas Aquinas in Rome, 
is involved in publishing biblical commentaries on St. Thomas and other medieval authors in the original Latin and in translation, and he's editor-in-chief of the International Review, Scientia et Fides. He's edited many books, written many articles and chapters, and besides two other monographs, he's recently written Phone Set Exemplum, Soteriological Christology in the Perspective of the Super Salmos of Thomas Aquinas. So that leads perfectly into his paper on Christ's will to die and our salvation in Aquinas' Super Salmum, Vigesimum Primum. So, Father Piotr, if we don't have a handout, get one from the back. First of all, thank you, Father Richard, for organizing this conference, for your warm welcome to all of us. And uh, it's nice to be here and uh, to have this place and time to consider for considering uh, St. Thomas Aquinas from Biblical Thomas' perspective. And uh, you probably know that uh, the surname of the Father Richard, Conrad, is very familiar to all Polish people because of the uh, Joseph Konrad Korzeniowski, the, the novelist, so I, I will try to, to speak English with, uh, with the same accent, and, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm still, uh, it's still Polish accent, so it's good if you have the draft of my, uh, of my presentation. Uh, so uh, I would start with the question, why Psalms matter for biblical Thomism? The commentary on the book of Psalm was the last text which Aquinas dictated in his life. After commenting on the letters of St. Paul, some books of the Old and New Testament, and having a recognized position as Magister in Sacra Scriptura, Aquinas started to work on the commentary on the Psalm. Perhaps it's a kind of unwritten, of course, Summa Exegetica, because the Super Psalmo somehow reflects his style, method, and hermeneutical rules. Both his uh, Summa Theologiae, and the commentary on the Psalms are unfinished work. We have only a third part of commented Psalms, up to Psalm 54, which will definitely break off due to experience of December 6, as we know. They originate from the period when commenting on the Psalms was a very popular practice, and many theologians began their careers with commentaries on the Psalms. For Thomas, it's not the beginning, but the culmination uh, of his theological work. Why did he start so late, we can ask? There are no clear answers, but perhaps an outline of the history of the commentaries on the Psalms in the Middle, in the middle Ages can be helpful in this respect. The Super Psalmos was written in the period which Martin Morart describes as the change of the epochs. In Aquinas' time, only few masters commented on the Psalms. It seems that their interest was directed to the St. Paul and the synthesis of biblical theology, then contrasted with the achievement of science. In fact, this is the background against which the project of the Summa Theologia was created. There are no commentaries on the Psalms by Albert the Great or Bonaventure, and only in the 14th century will the psalm return as a biblical book commented at medieval universities because, probably, of its importance for the culture of the Christian West. In the context of our conference, we can ask the following questions. Why do psalm matters in biblical Thomism? In what way can we discover their theological message? Biblical Thomism is not only a simple exploration of forgotten text of Aquinas, but essentially it consists, I think, in following his method or form of his faults, the coordinates on which his doctrinal reflection can be located. The question arises how to approach some topics. It's about a specific way of proceeding which could be compared to the force of gravity. I'm from Torun, so the birthplace of Nicolas Copernicus, and uh, cosmic comparisons are very familiar to me. Moreover, Aquinas compare, for, ex for example, the act of grace to the tides of the sea, when he wonder what is natural in the world. 
So following his, uh, this style, we can say that Thomas' theology gravitates towards biblical texts, circulates around them, and builds a synthesis based on the testimony of Revelation. The point is to understand the biblical reasoning of Aquinas and bring out its speculative approach. From biblical Thomism understood in this way, the theology as the resonation of the word of God emerged, in which the fathers are echoed and the synthesis is born due to continuous unifying process around the biblical center, using all available knowledge and its consistent interpretation. There were different approaches to this concept in the past, either climbing to the biblical center and not allowing resonance in the tradition, perhaps we can uh, define in this way the <coughs> Protestant approach, or the evolutionist view which underlined that the only thing that counts is the echo of the word. So it's uh, the position of liberal theology. Biblical Thomas is an attempt to combine both principles. First, the potentiality of the word of God, and the second, continuous search for speculative developments of that word in the history of its reception. As such, Thomas' theological projects are always provisional, never ready-made. It's not the theology which is stagnant, but open to the synthesis of supratione dei approach through its return to the word of God. In order to know the Thomistic style of interpretation of the Psalms, it's not sufficient to refer only to super psalmos, but also to those work of Thomas Aquinas in which he refers and quotes specific psalms. They are not always quoted in full, often just with the formula secundum illud psalmi. The great number of these quotations, often in the set contra, where Aquinas' philological thinking condenses, testifies to the, psalmist, the psalm's uh, argumentative value. At the same time, to grasp the full message of Aquinas, it's necessary to take into account the magna glossatura of Peter Lombard and to compare it to the tertia pars, uh, which was written at the same time as the super psalmos. Precisely for that reason, our topic here will be one of the themes raised in both of these works, the passion of Christ as a way of realizing our salvation. I'm convinced that this is an important issue in our current crisis of soteriology, which is, in fact, a kind of idolatry of anthropotechnics. The only culturally accepted form of salvation nowadays is a kind of auto-soteriology, which sees salvation first as purely temporal and secondly as a result of exclusively human action. Therefore, the question is, rephrasing a bit St. Anselm, cur Deus crucifixus, that it may be a chance to regain the soteriological framework. I believe that one of the Psalms, number uh, 21, Deus, Deus, meus, quare me de reliquisti, in particular, is suitable for such analysis. This is a special Psalm because for Aquinas it's a mirror in which he reads the course of the Passion of Christ. From a hermeneutic point of view, he interprets it ad literam as the text on the Passion of Christ and figuratively as a story about King David and his sufferings. As a type of lamentation, this Psalm is interpreted by Aquinas integrally as part of all five Psalms which treat about uh, Christ's Passion. Uh, it's uh, 21, 34, 54, 68, and 108. Of course, all numeration is according to the Vulgate. Therefore, each of them, although starting with groaning, agemite, how is observing Aquinas in the commentary, however, leads to salvation and thanksgiving. This is also the fact that Christ begins the prayer on the cross with these words. It's not, for Aquinas, an expression of despair, of Christ, but a recitation of the way of salvation, via salutis, which begins with suffering. Therefore, the perspective of interpretation, also supported by the title of the psalm by St. Jerome, the morning star, suggests, as the other side of the coin, the resurrection. Aquinas' uh, inter interpretation of the psalm takes into account the linguistic nuances 
in the Greek and Hebrew version, there is no the second verse, look at the me, but also references to heresy, for instance, Fyodor of Mopsuestia and Arius, but also focuses, especially at the beginning, on the significance of Jesus being abandoned by the God, the Father. The first part of the psalm, in the form of questions, is for St. Thomas a manifestation of the attitude of Jesus, who considers the cause of his passion. Thomas confronts general questions about why Christ suffers or is, uh, is uh, the abandoned innocent, since the Old Testament is full of assurances about God saving to the rightness, whose glory shines when the good prosper. These two arguments seem for Aquinas strong and amazing, but the answer is also fundamental. St. Thomas sees in the psalm the tension between the two salvations, temporal and eternal, originating respectively from the Old Testament and the New Testament. The abandonment concerns a temporal understanding, which is the foretaste of eternal one. The same thought is expressed in a commentary on the other psalm, 19, in which Thomas notices two ways of being saved by God. This is the salvation on Christ's left and right side. For Aquinas, its true salvation is not only a release from evil, but also a confirmation rooting in the good. It's not just a break from the embrace of the enemy, as indicated by the Hebrew term of salvation, breaking out of the hopeless situation, as in the case of someone surrounded tightly by enemy, finding an uh, unexpected way of rescuing, gaining permanent access to the good. That should be uh, the main definition of salvation for Aquinas, not respect to evil, but this permanent access to the good. The concept of salvation in the New Testament, accomplished by Christ, is analogical to the relationship between the literal and spiritual sense. It's not the rejection of one to get the other. This is not a racket which, when launched, loses individual elements which are redundant along the way. The spiritual sense for Aquinas is, and here I think the debate was right, the development of the literal sense. Thus, there is no division into two senses, but a certain path which always begins with a literal sense. In the anthropology of Aquinas, man comes to spiritual matters through the material means, not directly. So that is also true of salvation, which has to do with temporal liberation as inhoatio of what is truly and fully uh, the salvation. What's the causa passionis, uh, soteriological lenses of, of the Psalm uh, 21? During the Eucharist, when pronouncing the words of uh, the consecration, it's repeated that at the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion. He quicum passioni voluntarie traderetur. Very short observation that Latin we have five words and English twelve. In <laughs> Polish also twelve. The preserved verb voluntarie, willingly, regarding the method is extremely important. It's to emphasize that the death which Jesus Christ underwent is not accidental. This is not an unfortunate coincidence, nor the effect of a simple plot of opponents which could surprise Jesus and bring unexpected death. Aquinas strongly underlines this characteristic of death by stating that, I quote, the passion of Christ was dependent on his will. On his side, is, uh, it's uh, the act of will which Aquinas transmit with many expressions such as, quote, he gave himself to death. Who then is the cause of Jesus' death? Thomas, using the Aristotelian description of causality, perhaps it's, uh, we can compare it to, to scientific approach to, to our times, asks about the cause of the passion. He offers of twofold response. Christ did not kill himself, but he was killed by others. These are the facts. So, in a sense, can Jesus be considered the cause of his death and the salvation that he brought? We have to do here with some kind of modus dicendi, 
a, cate a category often used in Thomistic exegesis to describe way of expressing thought which must be taken into account in order to grasp the presented thesis. Stressing that acceptance of death will consist in the fact that he didn't take actions which could prevent his death. Christ, by the power of his divine nature, could avoid the cross, but it didn't happen. Not avoiding, he does contribute to the effect of the cross. It reminds us of someone who has not closed the window during the rain, says Aquinas, and this is the reason why there is water in the room. He, she is the cause of the wet floor in the room. In this way, St. Thomas tries to answer the question of how Christ wills his death. This opens the reflection of the true causa passionis, and therefore the causative power of the passion, which is the subject of the Questio 47 of the Tertia Pars. It's, however, worthwhile to begin with the analysis of the formulas which express the character of Christ's death, and then to grasp the soteriological sense and answers the main question why this topic seems to be important for Aquinas from a theological point of view, and why it's a part of the liturgical description. The death of Christ, whom Christians recognize as God, was already among the first listeners of the gospel, Jews and pagans, perceived as a scandal and stupidity, as St. Thomas observes in the commentary on the first letter to the Corinthians. The passion of Christ seems, I quote, to Jews a stumbling block, because they desire strength for working miracles and show weakness suffering, and to the gentle's foolishness, uh, because it seemed against the nature of human reason that God should die, and that a just and wise man should voluntarily expose himself to a very shameful death. End of quotation. This voluntary exposition to death, however, reveals the power of God which overcomes these two obstacles. In addition, St. Thomas, in his commentaries and systematic works, give several reasons for this action of God, offering rationes, which show the motive, uh, motives of God's action, indicating the harmony and appropriateness of God's conduct. One of the main expressions of the death of Jesus, which exceeds the simple statement of the fact of suffering, is the self-giving, which testifies to the double betray which the Son of God experiences. The same action can be judged relying on the attitude. On the one hand, the father betrayed his son in his freedom and give, uh, gives himself out of love. But in the case of others, notes Aquinas, the motivation for the betraying of Jesus are different. I quote, Judas betrayed Christ from greed, the Jews from envy, the Pilate from worldly fear, for he stood in fear of Caesar, and these accordingly are held guilty. Among the many terms used by St. Thomas, it's worth mentioning the following. Se ipsum tradidit passus est voluntarie, voluntarie mortem sustinuit, voluntarie subit, voluntarie mortuis fuit, dando se ad passionem, se ipsum pateretur, ex propria voluntate, Christus propria voluntate es passus. Although this formula seems diverse, all of them transmit the same truth of the voluntary character of Jesus' death. It reveals the fundamental truths about Christ himself and his work of salvation, that's the doctrinal aspect, and an example of a moral action that Christians reconstruct, in some sense, in themselves. Not so much as exemplum, external example to be imitated, but more as exemplar that's pattern to be applied in one's action. It's an expression of divine way of overcoming evil by a voluntary choice of the greater good. And this is the really sense of satisfaction in, in Thomas' theology. What does this mean then that Christ enter willingly into his passion? Aquinas offer some uh, four answers to that question. Aquinas starts his reflection uh, with the question whether the passion of Christ is necessary for our salvation, and he answers it using the Aristotelian distinction of necessity. The first one is a necessity which by nature excludes its opposite. 
in the sense that passion was not necessary because the choice of such a way of human salvation was not the only one possible. However, it has become necessary in the other sense, conditional, when external factors are involved, as if someone stands in our way and forces us, us to stop. The human sin led to the situation in which the death of Jesus was an appropriate way of responding to evil. The necessity of the second time is expressed by the language of appropriateness, conveniencia, which is used by St. Thomas, both when considering the incarnation and the death of Son of God on the cross. Furthermore, the passion of Christ was not necessary on the part of the Father who would impose his passion to the, on, the, on the Son. Fulfilling the will of the one who sent him does not destroy the freedom of the incarnate word. Similarly, there is no need for Christ himself who would have to betray himself internally, but his suffering was voluntary. If, on the side of Christ, there is consent to death, he is a victim of an unjust trial and evil which is revealed during the Passion, what does it prove? What does it testify to? For St. Thomas, in the context of the question 56 of the Third Pars, regarding the <coughs> fruitness of the Resurrection, the Passion is, paradoxically, the manifestation of the power of God, which thus destroys death just like the resurrection of Jesus is the efficient and exemplary cause of our resurrection and return to life. Why is the death of Jesus, which was lived through the death of death itself, does the voluntary acceptance of it matter? The acceptance of the human body was a union with the human nature which, thanks to the relationship to God, gains the opportunity to overcome death. Jesus could have saved that what he truly accepted. This emphasis in the Christology of Aquinas on the reception of the body by Christ explains the, this soteriological logic. On the other hand, his willingness itself fits into the process of shaping our faith and testifies to the uh, status of the person of the world who accepts humanity without losing the deity. St. Thomas explains, I quote, Christ was not held fast by any necessity of death, but was free among the dead. And therefore he abode a while in death, not as one held fast, but of his own will, just so long as he deemed necessary for the instruction of our faith. End of quotation. According to Aquinas, the voluntary death testifies to the fact that our death and Jesus, one, are similar and different at the same time. As he explained in Compendium Theologiae, uh, death which consists in separating the soul, the soul from the body in us occurs necessarily or by nature, uh, but in the incarnate Lord it occurs ex potestate et propria voluntate. In the case of the incarnate world, the power of divinity embraces all of his nature. So when he wanted uh, his body and soul to remain in unity, and when he wanted to break up, break up. This power over death manifested itself in the ability to shout from the cross, which, according to Aquinas, along with the short time of dying, which in the case of other convicts was long, contribute to the centurion statement of the divinity of Jesus. This, in turn, leads Aquinas to realistic statement. I quote, Yet we may not... Over the Jews didn't kill Christ, or that Christ took his own life. For the one who brings the cause of death to bear on a person is said to kill him. But death doesn't ensue unless the cause of death prevails over nature, which conserves life. Christ had it in his power either to submit his nature to the destructive cause or to resist that influence, just as he willed. Thus Christ died voluntarily, and yet the Jews kill him. That Jesus' willingness is an indication of his divine nature and his will to which everything is subordinated. This particular relationship of Jesus to his own death, revealing that he is not a purus homo, 
but always verus homo, is at the center of interpretation of the text in uh, another biblical commentary, uh, Super uh, Ioannem. I quote, But in Christ his own nature and every other nature are subject to his will, just like artifacts are subject to the will of the artisan. Thus, according to the pleasure of his will, he could lay down his life when he will, and he could take it up again. No more human being can do this, although he could voluntarily use some instrument to kill himself. This explains why the centurion, seeing that Christ didn't die by a natural necessity, by, uh, but by his own will, since uh, Jesus cried again with a loud voice and yelled up his spirit, recognized the divine power in him. And that's why he said, truly, this was the Son of God. Other terms, sustinere and subit, which are associated with voluntarie, refers to this understanding of the passion in which Jesus allows the weakening of his divine power. His willingness proves that the source of suffering is not only external, but also has an internal principium. Willingness illustrates the power of Jesus who overcomes death and iniquity. This is the reason why the physical presence alone of the crucified among the Williams is not the most important, but, as Chrysostom observes, the conversion and introduction of a good William to paradise. <clears throat> Willingness expresses, above all, an indication of who Jesus is, the Lord of nature, of life, and of death. This message is interpreted by St. Thomas in Codlibet I. The awareness that Christ is the true God and man, and therefore everything that is in him is in harmony with and subservient to that which is divine, that is why his soul at the same time suffered and experienced happiness, because it was by virtue of the will of Jesus that there was no redundantia between the higher and the lower action of the soul, which doesn't happen in the case of all the people because of the natural connection between powers. It was stopped by the power of his voluntary decision. That is why we cannot speak about suicide on, in his case. In this way, St. Thomas also explains the word of Christ, destroy this temple, when he thought about his body. Aquinas analyzes the exact meaning of sol vita, the Latin term indicates a solution rather than demolition, which shows the consent of Jesus to be treated in this way while actively opposing his uh, enemies. Why then did Jesus agree to be tormented, although he didn't have uh, to suffer? The reason is that, in this way, he respects our dignity and provokes re reciprocity. He could have done it with one act of his will, but the choice of the cross and death implies the inclusion of people into a certain process. The key is to understand the communication between the members of the mystical body with its head, a theme present in the entire commentary on the Psalms, where this unity is constantly emphasized as the heritage of St. Augustine and his idea of Christus totus. The believer is one mystic person with Christ. It's not, therefore, a legalistic understanding of the redemptive death of Jesus in the, in the key of satisfying the wrath of God after the sin of man, but the union of the faithful with Christ, which is based on solidarity. From its true meaning of reparation originates, which will be discussed later. The fact that Christ willingly accepts the passion is expressed in the comments of Aquinas not only through direct phrases which emphasize this idea, to uh, the quotes themselves which appear not as simple illustration of the thesis, but, but the opening and deepening the uh, study subject play an important role in his theological thinking. In the case of voluntary passion, an important confirmation of the scripture is the quotation from Isaiah uh, 53, Oblatus est quia ipse voluit, which Aquinas cites several times in his writing. The second answer of Aquinas is that willingness is an expression of Christ's obedience. 
In the exegesis of the Psalm 21, Aquinas leads the leader as if on two parallel levels. On the one hand, he focuses on the sense of the passion which brings the salvation of man. On the other hand, he perceives in on the meta plan, in the context of the whole history of salvation, the need for redemption and domination of evil. This macro scale is complemented with the focus on the details of the account of the Passion. The first of the levels emphasizes the consent of Jesus to the Passion, it, uh, and it is expressed in many formulas which illustrating the meaning of Christ's surrender. Thomas interprets Jesus' death on his uh, metaphysical coordinates of causality. Therefore, there is no problem for him that it's voluntary, Jesus agreed on it, and at the same time, it's the fault of the perpetrators. The consent of Jesus to death means that it's not a mere historical circumstance, but it has a sacrificial significance. This is explained directly by Aquinas. I quote, Christ didn't suffer that which comes of sickness, lest he should seem to die of necessity from exhausted nature. He, but he endured death inflicted from without, to which he willingly surrendered himself, that his death might be shown to be a voluntary one. End of quotation. So, for St. Thomas, the passion for uh, expropria voluntate means doing this obedience to the Father, who doesn't give an order to the Son as something external. I quote, it's indeed a weak and cruel act to hand over an innocent man to torment and to death against his will. Yet God the Father didn't so deliver up Christ, but inspire him with the will to suffer for us. End of quotation. Aquinas points to three possible understanding of how the Father betrayed the Son. This indicates, first, eternal knowledge and a bizarre arrangement that the Father inspired Jesus with the will to suffer by pure love, and that he didn't defend him from torment. For Thomas, willingness means obedience of Jesus, which is possible when the will to do accomplishes something undertaking in freedom. There is no obedience where man has no way out and cannot act otherwise, and at the same time, when obedience concerns difficult matters, and such is undoubtedly death, the more price-worthy it is. It's clear, therefore, that voluntarie denotes more than the statement of the lack of coercion, because it's a positive expression of the will of Christ, which is full of virtue, since per obedientia intelligitur omnis virtus. The will to suffer for us is not an empty will, free from being shaped by good, but emerging from good. The willingness is the evidence of this awareness of goodness. This reflection will be deepened by the reflection of St. Thomas on the subject of obedience of Christ, which he develops on the basis of interpretation of the famous hymn from uh, Philippians' letters. In Aquinas' exegesis, obedience is identified with humanity. You have the, the old quotation from, from that commentary, but I will just, the last sentences, uh, I will quote last uh, sentences of that commentary. That the, this obedience is great and commendable is evident from the fact that obedience is great when it follows with the will of another against one's own. Now the movement of the human will tends towards two things, namely to life and to honor. But Christ didn't refuse death. Furthermore, he didn't flee ignominy, ignominy. Hence, he says, even death on the cross, which is the most shameful. Thus, he neither refused death nor an ignominious form of death. St. Thomas also depends, depends uh, the path of Christ's obedience, which overcomes the, the disobedience of the first parents. The logic of the superiority of obedience is not a matter of parallels, but the greater good which lies behind obedience. And the metaphysical rule that cause, causes are similar to their effects. Therefore, in the letter to Romans, 
he points out that the death of Jesus it's not pleasing to God because of her alone, excommuni mortis ratione, because God didn't make death, or because of the behavior of the assassins of Jesus, whose action rather deepens the wrath of God. The only justification for Aquinas why Jesus' death can be the cause of reconciliation is, I quote, it proceeds from the will of Christ's suffering, which was a will formed to the endurance of death in obedience to the Father and out of love for man. From this aspect, Christ's death was meritorious and satisfied for our sins. It was accepted by God as sufficient for reconciling all men, even those who killed Christ. The essence of Jesus' obedience is rightness, because it relies on the observance of the law and thus makes people righteous. It doesn't contradict the motivation originating from love because Christ is obedient because of love. In an interesting way, St. Thomas makes a commentary on the Psalm 21, a reflection on the will of Jesus to give himself. Uh, in, this con- in this context, the expression Christ votum appears, which is used by St. Thomas to reveal Jesus' desire. Together with related quotes, it builds a semantic network in which St. Thomas observes that, I quote, Christ repays these woes uh, by giving himself to the passion, and furthermore, when he gave his body for the food of the faithful. And so he says, woes, that, that is, sacrifices, I will repay on the altar of the cross and the sacrifice on the faithful. And this I will do in the sight of those who fear him, who, who, he who fears the Lord honors his parents. The term votum vota is mainly present in the liturgy, including the Spanish Mozart liturgy, and in the corpus of Aquinas works in the sense of the voluntary commitment that Christ undertakes. It's a use of freedom which determines a specific goal. That's the meaning of of this term, uh, votum, or in plural, vota. Willingness of sacrifice. Another aspect of the voluntariness, uh, voluntariness of, uh, with which Christ undertakes the passion is an indication of the sacrificial dimension of his death. Therefore, it can be described as a hostia, both because uh, of the corruption caused by sin and the consent of the will to give up the passion. Thomas, relying on the Augustinian theory of sacrifice, emphasized in it uh, not so much the placatio of God, as a deed so that we may cling, uh, cling to God in holy fellowship, yet refer to the consummation of happiness wherein we can be truly blessed. It's not so much about changing the will of the insult person to appease him, but about the way by which a stronger relationship with God will be established. And this is possible if there is some good Thus, the sacrifice is about the power of God, which leads to intimacy. That is why sacrifice has always been combined with feasts, which testify to such a community. Having found this good in the human nature of the world incarnate, God can be appeased. What is so good in death of Jesus that it becomes a sacrifice which introduces man into new communion with God? St. Thomas' answer to that question is multi-level and based on his interpretation of the scripture. The analysis of the psalm during his lectures in Naples has a clear impact on his thinking. He emphasizes that because of the fact that the motive for Christ's action was love, this demonstrate voluntariness uh, turned out to be a great good which destroys the logic of evil. In the, fact, uh, in the face of death, Jesus remains in goodness behaves as the beginning of something good among the hostile environment, which is why Aquinas can summarize it in the following way. I quote, Christ's passion wrought our salvation, properly speaking, by removing evils, but the resurrection did so as the beginning and exemplar of all good things. End of quotation. The aforementioned remotio mali happens 
however, not through fighting with evil directly, we can say, but through increasing the presence of good, even in a situation which seemed completely over him by evil. Thomas' analysis of God's convenient action indicates this way of his conduct. It's a kind of race for a greater good in which evil is left behind. Therefore, redemption and salvation allow man to realize the good which has become impossible because of sin. It's submission to the power of love which transforms man and opens up goodness for him. This is how the possibility of true merit eternal life opens up for man. It's not collecting arguments to convince God in the future, in the last judgment, but the conviction that God offers a free cooperation with his grace, we are God's co-workers. Merit consists in the participation in good, which manifests itself in the ability to voluntarily endure all because of love, caritas. That good, found in human nature, in the voluntary death of the incarnate world, in the voluntary nature of Christ's salvific activity, is a gift of self. It rejects the image of God who is looking for revenge, but rather reveals himself as self-giving. It's not also about finding value in suffering as such, but seeing it as a means of expression, an opportunity to express obedience based on Christ's example. Voluntary expression of love. For St. Thomas, the voluntary attitude uh, with which Christ accepts passion is not only an indication of his divine nature, obedience to father or sacrifice, but also an indication of the love which justifies the entire work of redemption. There is no love without, without this willingness, a sign of true freedom which is able to sacrifice for another person. The voluntary death of Jesus can become a sacrifice because it's a manifestation of love although from the point of view of the perpetrators is, uh, it's considered a crime. Aquinas observes that, I quote, in order to demonstrate the fullness of his love on account of which he suffered, Christ upon the cross prayed for his persecutors. Love is the motive for the father's acceptance of the son's sacrifice. The concept of satisfaction is not about equalizing the accounts of evil, but by giving the insult person something that he value more than damage done by the mankind. I quote, But by suffering out of love and obedience, uh, Christ gave more to God than was required to compensate for the offense of the whole human race. Thomas compares this to the situation in which a man buys his way out of sin committed with his feet by means of deserving piece of work fulfilled by the, uh, by the hands. Forgiving sins requires reparation, understood as something on the part of the one who forgives sins, an act of will which, doesn't, uh, which does something good, like a sick person who is healed and as a sign of a grace demonstrates something in harmony with nature. It's a sign of granted grace, not its cause. It's a sign, not the cause. This shows the primary power of nature, which is able to follow the full good in the incarnate world and his human nature. There was satisfaction, satisfaction for all when he took a free death, suffering from love. So going to conclusions, an analysis of Aquinas' commentary of the Psalm 20, 21, in agreement with the Tertia Pars, has shown the basic framework of the soteriology of Aquinas, thanks to which it's possible to discover the true meaning of salvation, which emerged from the voluntary sacrifice of Christ on the cross. This is essentially a very biblical concept of, of salvation that we can discover in Aquinas' text. Thomas indicates that four fundamental effects that Christ gave up the passion of ex propria voluntate. He sacrificed doesn't coincide, coincide uh, with our understanding of the position of the victim as someone who is passive, for example, in a car accident, or leads to the perception of God as someone who requires suffering to reconcile us with each other. The key to understand the sacrifice of Christ is the good that the incarnate word accomplishes in human nature. 
Salvation means uh, breaking the power of evil by removing the obstacle on the way to achieving the good and placing the prototype of good, an exemplar, an exemplar of which is the, his resurrection. From this perspective, the voluntary nature of Jesus' death, professed during the celebration of the Eucharist, underlines the following truths. First, Christ during the Passion remains God. The voluntary acceptance of death doesn't prevent it from happening. It's not a positive wish for the evil of death. This, in turn, illustrates the true divine and human nature of Christ, as well as the choice of the path of suffering as an appropriate way to overcoming evil. Second, voluntarie means not acting under the dictatorship of evil. The acceptance of the passion means that the Son of God, in the situation of greatest suffering, because the suffering of the incarnate word is the highest suffering for Aquinas, in the world of evil logic, chooses good and trusts the Father. His sacrifice allows man to do good deeds, which by becoming married, reads to eternal life. Third, pointing to the passion as taken up by Christ, ex caritate, is the emphasis on satisfaction as the method of overcoming evil. Satisfactio is for St. Thomas the defeating of evil with greater good by virtue of previous unity with him and not as something external. That is why salvific power is not hidden in death as such, but in love as manifested in the voluntary acceptance of it. Vota Christi. This expression from the Super Psalmos indicates that sacrificial meaning of Christ's life and merit for our salvation. The desire for the salvation of man is linked with gradual uncovering of its fullness, the transition from the earthly to the spiritual salvation. Such are the words which Jesus says on the cross, quoting precisely this Psalm 21, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's not a question of Jesus, but a prayer of lamentations in which everything is directed towards the recognition of the situation of evil, in the first part of each lamentation, and in the second, the price of God for his faithfulness and the gift of salvation. Thus, the soteriology of Aquinas immersed in the biblical text is not juridical, but based on friendship. The Super Psalmos is a commentary which allows us to reconstruct the path of emerging synthesis in the tertia parts and encourage to practice Aquinas, Aquinas non Aquinatum. Thank you very much for your attention.